with uh, a question that's going to be phrased entirely in terms of matrices. Okay, so suppose somebody hands you a bunch of matrices. Let's say they're all square. Let's say there are m of them, and they're all of size n by n. Okay, yeah, and then right, they're right bigger. Oh, this is small. That's okay. You can continue bigger. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> So somebody gives you a bunch of matrices like this, and then they ask you, does the span contain an invertible matrix? What would you do? <laughs> OK. Uh, that's a serious question that I'm not going to give an answer to uh, yet. Okay, so let's let's just think of an example. So suppose I, you know, somebody handed me these three by three matrices and they handed me three of them, and the specific matrices are maybe let's say A1 is uh, and then A2 is one, two, three, two, one. And A3 is, let's say, 1, minus 1, 0, minus 1. What's the answer to this? Does the span of this contain an invertible matrix? It's not a hard question. <laughs> it's also not a trick question. No, right? OK, so the so answer in this case is no. But let me show you a funny way of doing this. So here's a funny proof. So let me define well, a matrix that depends upon epsilon. Okay, and I need to make sure I get this right. Uh, 1 over epsilon, 1 over epsilon, and epsilon squared. And I also define another matrix, which is also going to look something like this. Epsilon squared, 1 over epsilon, 1 over epsilon. Okay, so both of these guys are inside SLN, SL3. They have determinant one, right? The diagonal matrices. Okay, so now I want you to kind of do matrix multiplication and see what happens when you multiply something that looks like this, which is what all those three matrices look like. They have this block of zeros, right? Which is kind of how you guys knew that the answer was going to be no. This big block of zeros multiplied on the left with n, n epsilon and multiplied on the right with n epsilon. Okay? And I really shouldn't have to teach you this, but this thing multiplies the rows and this thing multiplies the columns. Okay? And so if you kind of compute what happens, you get epsilon a, epsilon b, epsilon to the 4c, epsilon d, and epsilon e. Kind of strange that even though I have some one over epsilons here, they don't actually show up on that side. Okay, and that's precisely because these two things correspond to the last two columns, first two rows, and those are all zeros. Okay, so this is a nice case, but but what but what I do? I took something, I multiplied on the left with something in SLN, something on the right is also in SLN, so the determinant should not change, correct? And the determinant is a continuous function. So the determinant of all these matrices should be whatever the original matrix was. And now I take epsilon going to 0. These things go down to 0. And a continuous function, if it's constant along a curve, it takes the same value at the limit. Elementary calculus. OK. There we go. Oops. So let me kind of. Rewrite this in a slightly different language. What I said was, I said, let me look at this tuple of matrices. Okay, so this is where it resides. So three copies of three by three matrices. And there's an action of a group on it. 
and this group is SLN cross SLN. Ah, SL3 cross SL3. Okay, and what did I do? I simply showed that you can take you can take elements of this group, act it on this point, and drive it down to zero. Okay, it's just another way of saying that zero belongs to the orbit closure. Okay, and so let me make this claim. Okay, and I'm going to make it in general. Okay, this this, this becomes m, and that becomes n. Not a problem. So, so zero is in the orbit closure, and that becomes SLN. Implies that the span has no invertible matrix. Do you agree with this? It's kind of the same statement, right? What about the converse? Two options: either you prove it or you find a counterexample. Okay, uh, but maybe let's hold on to that for a little bit. And now let me talk a little bit about some invariant theory. Okay, so it's a very general setup here, and the general setup is you have a group which is acting on some vector space. Okay, and maybe the group is reductive, and maybe the representation is algebraic. Okay, so it's kind of let's not take these two seriously at the moment. Okay, so now here's a, here's a kind of a, here are kind of two problems that are kind of inspired from this little uh, little thing that I did. So the first one is if I give you some element in your vector space, how can you tell me? If zero is in the orbit closure, what can you possibly do to tell me this? Okay. In that case, it's kind of funny, but how did I get these m epsilon and n epsilon? Okay. Maybe I gave you the same thing, but I changed the basis. Then it's kind of harder to find these things, right? Yes, it's something to do. Okay, and here's a slight generalization of it, but just as interesting. So if I give you two different points in the vector space, how can you decide if their orbit closures intersect? Okay. Uh, this is called the null cone problem, or at least I call it that. And this is called the orbit closure problem. Okay. So this name is fairly straightforward. This one is you just call the set of such points in the vector space, the null cone. Okay, so it's, that's quite obvious too. Uh, okay, so, uh, well, maybe not everybody has thought about this, but I kind of hinted at this, is uh, if you have an invariant function, a function that's constant along orbits, right, and it takes different values at the two points, then they have to be in different orbits. But they also have to be in different orbit closures. Right? Because continuous functions, if they take the same value along an orbit, they'll take the same value along the closure. Okay? But what's even nicer is if you add these things like this, you don't even have to look for all continuous invariant functions. It's enough to look at polynomial invariant functions. Okay? So let me just define this little thing. So if I write this, this just means set of all polynomial functions on V. Maybe I just stick to complex numbers for now. Okay? And then I'm looking for the polynomial functions that are invariant under the action of the group. There's a set of all functions such that it cannot differentiate between any two points in an orbit. Okay? And so the claim is that these rings, that these invariant polynomials, can answer these two questions. But then here comes the question, and it's kind of related to like why I said why I, I didn't you know phrase this in a more standard mathematical way. I said, what will you do if someone gives it to you? Okay, so I want to look at it in an algorithmic fashion. Okay, so what is the algorithm to do this? And then you you see some natural questions show up. So here are some natural questions that show up from an invariant theory perspective. Okay. 
Okay. So the first one is find me a minimal set of generators for this ring. Okay. So it's kind of silly, right, to try and look at every single polynomial in here. But it is a ring. We do know it's finitely generated, which is already a non-trivial statement, but let's say we know it. But uh, so why would you test all of them? Maybe you want to test just the generators. Okay. But then you have to be able to construct them, right? There you go. Okay. So here's another kind of similar sounding question, all asking about like how hard is this invariant ring? Okay, in a notion that still I'm not convinced with uh, what it means to quantify how hard an invariant ring is. But we'll make it precise sometime soon, or at least I hope to do so. Uh, what about an upper bound on the generator, on the degree of generators? Okay, so it's kind of not entirely clear if the upper bound is good enough to tell you whether it's easy or hard to construct a minimal set of generators, but it's a good indicator. Okay, if your upper bound is like one of these big functions that guy put up there, you know, I don't know, tower function, Ackerman function, then you have no hope, right? Okay, so let me kind of connect it back to this a little bit. Uh, So when the group is SLN cross SLN, and the vector space is m tuples of matrices, what is the null cone problem? The null cone problem solves what is called rational identity testing. Yeah? So maybe I'll be even more specific and say non-commutative rational identity testing. And this is one reason why null count problem, why these kind of problems can be kind of interesting. So let me first tell you what ra non commutative rational identity testing is. Say somebody gave you an expression that looks like this. Okay, so it's a non commutative rational expression. Okay, it's non-commutative because I insist that you don't know commutativity. So A, B inverse, A is not the same as A squared, B inverse. Okay, and you should be thinking matrices. It matters how you multiply. And then you can do inverses inside inverses. And you have no way to get rid of them easily. Now I'm asking you using just completely formal rules, is this equal to zero? Just completely abstractly. Like as expressions, can you do some, you know, just God-given rules, not even commutativity, and can you end up with canceling all the terms? And it presupposes that you have some division algebra. Yes, that's one way to test it. Yeah, but that's the that's the core of it. The core of it is okay. First of all, there is if you think about it, there's no naive algorithm to do this. If I gave it to you in the commutative setting. Okay, I gave you something that looks like a plus b squared minus a squared minus 2ab minus b squared. There's a way to test whether this is 0 or not. What is it? Just expand it all out, and it'll cancel each other out. How do you expand out a nested inverse? You can't do this. It's not easy. There's no naive algorithm, but then you, you have these people who, you know, and one of them sitting in the audience, uh, Avi Vigderson and Hubesh? Is his name Rubesh? Uh, yeah, so, so some of these people took this thing and said, any rational expression you can do, I will convert into a bunch of matrices, things that look like that. And now the question becomes, this is equal to 0 if and only if some bunch of matrices is in the null cone. Okay? And that can be solved algorithmically. 
due to the effort of several people that I don't, too many, too many to write. Fast. Yeah, fast. But so even procedure. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm asking. Even procedure. There's no naive procedure to do this, no? That's the important thing. But yes, we do want a fast procedure. But um, Okay, so what else do I have to say? I think that's... Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of done. Yeah. Okay, thanks.